Those of you will remember, I did a video response on Vicky's argument to do with the labour theory of value. Now she's done a video response to my video. I will google something for you, Scotty. Her first critique of my argument is where money comes from. I said that money only comes from the private sector or the printing press. For some strange reason, she seems to believe that the public sector can finance itself. Now, in her argument, she says that the Soviet Union lasted for about 70 odd years, as if that somehow critiques my argument. You can find Anthony C. Sutton's argument, where he gives much evidence for where the Soviet Union was getting all of its technology from. And if you actually understand history, you would know that the big banking corporate elite have been funding both sides of every war since the days of Napoleon. The heavy public sector was never going to be able to finance itself. A public sector can't finan finance itself. The public sector does not generate enough to even pay tax money. So this is the very reason why the public sector has paid its wages by the government. If the public sector financed itself, the government wouldn't be the one paying its wages. Tells you where the public sector gets its money from. It gets it from the government. Where does the government get the money from to finance the public sector? It gets it from from the private sector taxpayer. Now I can say that for myself because the fact I was born in a country that faced the heavy nationalisation and paid the heavy price for it. When there was very little of a private sector left before Margaret Thatcher, they were left with no other option but to run the printing press. And that was driving inflation through the roof and what did the socialists try to do? They tried to set down price ceilings. You saw that with of course the shortage at the pump in 1974. That's what caused the very problem. People like Vicky have never touched an economics textbook in their life, they couldn't even tell you what price floors and price ceilings cause. In fact, they make up excuses for socialism. Take, for example, in her video, in the same critique, she goes on about Venezuela and she tries to make up the excuse about that to do with, you know, the oil production, etc. Venezuela was facing an oil boom that started just before Hugo Chavez took over and the oil boom lasted right up until January of 2008. The oil boom was during a period when they would face food shortages and blackouts because you would see the blackouts in 2006 before the oil boom came to an end. You would also see the food shortage crisis begin in 2003. It was the price ceiling that caused the food shortage crisis and the very fact that it was during a period of an oil boom contradicts the narrative to say oh it was because there was some sort of oil price drop. No it wasn't. If you haven't got the money coming from the private sector the only place you're left with is the printing press. That was the very reason why in the early 1970s when they heavily nationalised the economy in Chile and they were already in serious trouble as they ran out of the taxpayers money from the private sector, they were left with no other option but to try and bail themselves out using the printing press. That is precisely why they hit hyperinflation because the inevitable reality is when you run the printing press, the greater the quantity of that paper in circulation, again in relation to do with scarcity, the less the less scarce the paper becomes, the more of it there is to go around. That's why the paper currency devalues in purchasing power, inflation drives up and eventually people lose faith in the currency, they drop it and that's why you end up hitting hyperinflation. Now in Great Britain in the 1980s, Britain was very close to hitting hyperinflation and that was because of all the socialism beforehand. That was precisely because of the heavy nationalisation, because the government was left with no other option but to run the printing press. The funny thing thing is, even the Labour Party of all places, a socialist party in Great Britain, under the name of Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn even concedes the fact that he wouldn't finance the economy by the, pr the private sector. He wanted to run the printing press. But where we would disagree is I don't think that alternative comes from printing money. But the issue that I've raised concern with you about is your proposal for the Bank of England to print money. That's because that's the only other place that you can get money from. You've only got two options, the private sector or the printing press. If we look at the economy of the Soviet Union, they didn't print their money and they didn't have a private sector. Now how did this country survive for 69 nice years if like the money can only come from the printer or from the private sector, huh? And it's government that pays 100% of their wages. They don't get their wages from anywhere else. And where does government get the money from? The government gets the money from the private sector taxpayer. Why else do you think Margaret Thatcher came out and said the problem with socialism is 
you'll eventually run out of other people's money. What she was basically saying was, you'll eventually run out of the taxpayers' money of the private sector. The point of the issue being is the fact that the public sector cannot finance itself. It doesn't generate enough to even finance itself. It doesn't even pay tax money. It pays what you call a rebate. They pay a percentage back to government for what government initially gave them in the first place. That's a rebate. A rebate is not the same thing as taxation. You show me a public sector that is not being paid its wages by the government. So that's the very reason why I mentioned about that socialism is going to be faced with with regards to the exploitation. Let's move on to her second argument. She then tries to make the critique based on that to do with the Soviet Union and says somehow that it wasn't faced with the economic calculation problem. The economic calculation problem was an argument to critique socialism in its inefficiency. You can see by surplus waste problems, by shortage problems, the main argument of Ludwig von Mises, the economic calculation problem is to do with resource misallocation. Resources having alternative uses. Is that each and every single natural resource that you have has alternative uses. That is to say, if you took, for example, a natural resource like oak, it has many different, you know, uses. You can use oak wood for producing bookcases, for producing desktops, for producing tables, for producing chairs. You're going to need to know how much of that natural resource that you're going to use and to producing each and every single option you could possibly think of. For example, bookcases. But there isn't just one style of bookcase of oak. There's a variety of different kinds of oak bookcases. When it comes down to socialism, it destroys the information of profits and losses. So there's no way for you to know the information of where to allocate resources efficiently, right? Because there's no price signal information to do so. So here is a quote by two Soviet Union economists that pretty much emphasise that the economic calculation problem was rife within the Soviet Union that she tried to deny. State purchases increased and now all the distribution centres are filled with these pelts. Industry is unable to use them all and they often rot in warehouses before they can be processed. The Ministry of Light Industry has already requested Wisconsin twice to lower purchasing prices but the question has not been decided yet. And this is not surprising. Its members are too busy to decide. They have no time besides setting prices on these pelts. They have to keep track of another 24 million prices. Of of course, the very fact that you saw surplus waste of these pelts being left to rot in warehouses is proof of the economic calculation problem. The economic calculation problem is saying that socialism is so wasteful. It misallocates resources into producing things that are not selling. That's exactly what I meant by value. Because it's all well saying, oh well, it's all labour. Oh, well, well, very good. You've stuck it out there on the shelf, nobody's buying it. In other words, you've just wasted a natural resource. But to further solidify the point on the two Soviet Union economists, Nikolai Shmelev and Vladimir Popov, they go on to say, No matter how much we wish to organise everything rationally, without waste, no matter how passionately we wish to lay all the bricks of the economic structure tightly, with no chinks in the mortar, it is not yet within our power. This is coming from two Soviet Union economists contradicting everything that basically Vicky was telling you. The reason they stopped saying this was because the Soviet Union and many other socialist countries just like it, kept on producing what the people needed anyways, without a free market. Ah, so the economic calculation problem really is a fallacy from years ago, uh, which we've moved past by simply the fact that the Soviet Union exists this proves the economic calculation problem because you can produce things in enough abundance for everybody to have things, you know? In other words, so socialism typically takes natural resources and allocates it into parts of the market where there are losses. And what are losses? Losses are part of the market where consumers are not in demand of. People are not spending. The fact that resources are finite should tell you that it's important to understand where you're going to allocate those scarce natural resources and into what parts of the market. Common sense would tell you that you allocate production of resources into something that's going to sell. Parts of the market 
where the profits are. And the only way that you're going to know that information of where the profits are is if you hold the information of market driven prices. Destroy that information, you don't hold that information. Both Nikolai Shmelev and Vladimir Popov, the Soviet Union economists, go on to explain. To make one tonne of copper, we use about 1000 kilowatt hours of electrical energy as against 300 in West Germany. To produce one tonne of cement, we use twice the amount of energy that Japan does. I mean, if that is not evidence of the economic inefficiency and economic calculation problem, then what is? These were two Soviet Union economists. They completely contradict our entire argument. One of our commenters came along to my channel and said that she absolutely destroyed me. <laughs> Destroyed me by saying what? By saying that the public sector can finance itself? <laughs> You cannot be serious. We've got video evidence of the economic calculation problem. You see, the importance of why you have in your supermarkets market-driven prices to tell you the information of profits and losses is so that you can keep waste to a minimal level. Now, in one of our videos before, she goes on to mention about that of the surplus waste of food that's just left to dump by supermarkets. Lo and behold, she forgot to tell you that that was the to blame on all of the socialist subsidies by government. Of course, she doesn't understand the difference between a private sector left be to regulate itself and the absence of government subsidies to that of a private sector, you know, rancid with government subsidies. So of course, incompetency and exploitation will be rife in today's economy. If you destroy the private sector, good luck trying to avoid exploitation then, because when you run the printing press, you make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Why is that? The rich are not going to be affected by the devaluation of a paper currency. They're the ones sitting with all the assets. So Vicky doesn't really understand the whole thing to do with value. She doesn't understand that there's time preference. She doesn't realize that when it comes down to where you're going to allocate resources. She doesn't realize if you take, for example, you know, summer clothing, People are not going to want summer clothing during the winter period, are they? You no know, value is going to change with that of time. She doesn't comprehend and she thinks that value is just something you can fix. Value is something endogenous with re relative to that, to do with that of prices as well. So she thinks value is just something pretty much what Kevin D. Williamson touched upon. First of all, have a listen to what Kevin D. Williamson says here. And this, by the way, comes from Ludwig von Mises initially, because that's Ludwig von Mises' main critique of Marxism. Listen to this. As we know from our discussion of the labor theory of value, socialists of the Marxian bent hold prices to be at some level objective. In part, this is an outgrowth of socialism's pretense that it is a scientific system for understanding and organizing a society. If economic values are in constant flux, as is known by anybody who has followed the stock market or observed pricing trends at your local grocery store, then central planning is impossible. To counteract that criticism, socialism posits that economic values are fixed and knowable. For the socialist, a product has a certain value and it is a moral imperative that the worker be compensated at a level equal to the value of the thing produced. Under the socialist understanding, prices are endogenous, an aspect of the thing itself, reflecting the material, resources, time, expertise, and above all, the labor involved in its creation. But for Mises, and for practically all modern economists, prices are exogenous, reflecting only how people value a particular product. This may seem like an oversimplification, a product is only worth what you can sell it for, but in practice, the radical subjectivism of Mises provides an infinitely richer and more nuanced model of pricing, and thus of human action, than does the static Marxist model. That's because the Mises model asks not only what is it worth, but what is it worth to whom, at what time, in what context, in relation to what other goods. Right, so in other words, my camera, for example, the 5D Mark III, over time, because of newer technology and it coming out, that value changes with time, because newer and better technology continuously comes out. It's all that labour and all the hard work that labour puts in that gets the product out of the ground that puts the value to it. Uh, no, if that was the case, the, the film made on Robert LeBruce, shall I say, it would have been valuable. But there lies the problem. A lot of labour time went into producing the film on Robert LeBruce. Labour quantity went into producing the film, a lot of money was poured into producing the film, and yet when the film came out, nobody wanted to see it. In fact, even the cinemas rejected it. 
and turned it down because they didn't want it. It wasn't valuable. It's all well saying, oh well, but you know something, Labour went into producing it. Yeah, very good. How much money are you going to get for it? Only determined on whether or not it's going to sell. If something is not going to sell, it's not very valuable, is it? If that was the case then, and the quantity of labour, etc, in assembling such a product, if labour was purely what determined what value was, then every single product out there that's not selling on the shelves would be valuable. But it's not. It's what consumer preference wants. You don't get to control the consumer. What the consumer says goes. What the market says goes. Now that's not to say that labour itself isn't valuable. The reality is Whatever you put out there in the market, if consumers are not going to want it, you've literally taken a natural resource, you've wasted it. Let's take it in idiot's language. Music. Not everybody likes the same music. Not everybody likes the same albums. Not everybody likes the same games. But each and every single individual of society all have different tastes. Mortal Kombat in the building? That's pretty lit, honestly. It'll take $20, but um, I haven't seen Mortal Kombat in a while. I might take this one. Which one, bro? That's Dirt a, Rally. That's an old school. Dirt that's a classic really? game. Looks kind of crazy, bro. It's classic. I don't know about this one, man. I don't know. And what they value, they might have more value upon a specific album or game. Maybe the best album ever made in the history of music. Over that of other people. So the only way that you're going to determine its value is down to individual consumer preference and demand. If you remove the consumer and did not allow consumers to drive prices, you don't know that information. You don't know the individual's preference. Since you've no longer got each and every single individual of society to tell you what each and every single album is worth, or each and every single game is worth, who the hell's going to determine it? Are you going to determine it simply because, oh well, we got this amount of people working on this specific game, this amount of labour went into producing this product? Yeah, very good. The only way that you're going to be able to determine subjective theory of value and individual preference is through profits and losses, through prices being fluctuating in the market. That's capitalism. By your logic, the pelts would have been valuable. Who contradict yourself and said that scarcity does not determine value? Okay. There is a price due to the fact that there's scarcity, but there isn't value from scarcity. Let's use paper currency. Again, by your logic, you seem to think that just because you use a large quantity of labour into producing something, by your logic, you can somehow fix the problem of the paper currency. In other words, you think that you can just print a large quantity of that paper currency and at the same time make its purchasing power drive up. You think that if you just got a lot of labour involved in it, that's going to change the reality? You think a lot of labour is just going to change the value of the paper currency? Because so long as you're printing the fiat currency, the more the currency devalues in purchasing power. It's losing its purchasing power because it's larger in supply. And again, you go back to the games. A lot of people, you know, spend hard work and years producing games. So by your logic, Every single game that you could possibly imagine are all valuable. That's quite interesting, that is. Last time I checked, certain games lose their value very quickly. And that's because... <laughs> consumer preference. It's the gamers who get to determine what the real value is. They're the ones who determine the value. Because after all, they're the ones who are going to either buy them or not. Now, the main concession from you, Vicky, is the fact that you later concede and you say that scarcity does actually determine value. This argument is, well, if not everyone has it, that gives it a value, uh, which might be true in a supply and demand system, uh, but in a system in which you have uh, a look at, you know, the material reality, um, the fact that something is in one place and not in another does not generate value to you. Again, what you're ignoring is the laws of supply and demand. The diamond is actually determined through the laws of supply and demand because there's a scarcity of the diamonds, it's harder to obtain, and of course there's a very high demand for that type of jewellery. You can see then you say that you do understand the laws of supply and demand, then surely you would understand that then, because then you would- Yes, I understand the laws of supply and demand, but there is another way to look at it. Instead of being like, oh, diamonds are expensive because they're rare, you can be like, well, because they are rare, it takes a lot of labor to find diamonds, okay? So because there's lots of labor, they're valuable. You can use both of these theories.
That's a big concession, a very big concession, and Marxism itself and communism itself tries to defy the laws of supply and demand. In other words, Marxists live in a utopian, deluded fantasy world where they th seem to think they can have post-world scarcity. That's, like, that's like saying you can have a post-world scarcity of beachfront housing. There's only so much, you know, available land. There's only so many beachfront houses you can build. And in the following argument, you try to say that nobody makes the argument on defining socialism around economic central planning. Now, you really are having a laugh. The main critic by Ludwig von Mises against socialism and main critique with the economic calculation problem is to do with Karl Marx's economic central planning, the belief that you can centrally plan the economy. That was the main critique against Marxism. What is socialism? Idealistic socialists in the West usually will tell you that socialism is anything other than what actual socialist governments have achieved in the real world. Socialism means, among other things, using political agencies to provide goods and services that otherwise would be provided privately in the marketplace. In its most extreme form, socialism means government direction of the economy as a whole. Socialism, in its milder expressions, takes the form of nationalized industries, the Chilean copper mining industry under Allende, Pakistan's petrochemical sector, and heavy industries under Bhutto. Government ownership or direction of firms, Alfa Romeo under Mussolini, the Japan National Railway, direct government provision of goods and services, the British Health Service, or government management of nominally private marketplace activities, farm subsidies in France, Fannie Mae in the United States. Beyond the public provision of non-public goods, a second factor, economic central planning, will be crucial to identifying and understanding what differentiates real socialism from the normal mishmash of welfare state policies typically found in Western liberal democracies and affiliated forms of government. Socialism means central planning. Socialist central planning always works best for the class that produces the central planners, who can see to it that their own interests are relatively well served, which is why in the United States, socialism is a phenomenon of the middle class. So if you guys have got anything you would like to add, any comments on that, please comment in the comment section below. If you've got anything to ask, comment, and of course I'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you for watching my video, and I shall talk to you later. I'm going to go and, you know, get down to my football manager, of course, to win Rangers the league title number 55. Talk to you later. Cheers.